pleasure to have a chance to talk to Adrian Mayer, one of my former teachers and inspirations. Adrian, when and where were you born? I was born within a sea lion roar of the, of the zoo in Cumberland Terrace, one of the Nash Terraces in Regent's Park. And when was that? That was in 1922. I shall be 95 in three weeks' time. Five so, weeks' time, I think it is. Yeah. So in October? Uh, no, sorry, it, it's a bit later than that. We'll have to cut that bit out. In, <laughs> uh, in December, it's in, in December. December. Three months' time, not three weeks. Yeah, well, that's fine. So you were born actually in the same year as my mother, but you're a few months younger. Is that right? I see. <laughs> <laughs> a few months younger. Um, it's always interesting to know about an anthropologists' ancestors, um, and some people like to go back a few generations, but some just go back to their grandparents. Could you tell me something about your ancestry? Yes. Well, I'm a I'm a first generation immigrant. Uh, I think under the possibly under Brexit, I would be. Uh, I would have to register of something in some way. Um, uh, my father came from Germany, from Mannheim. Um, his father was uh, a hop merchant. I think I remember him saying he was the first person to sell German hops to Guinness in Dublin. Uh, he died uh, in his early 50s, I think. Of um, uh, of diabetes before they had discovered insulin, mm. uh, so I never knew him. And my father came here in uh, 1896 uh, to work with an, uh, the firm of, a, of an uncle of his, his mama, mm. uh, his mother's brother or mother's uncle perhaps, mm. who was a Seligman, uh, who uh, was a family with wide. Uh, interests in, in Britain and America. And he started off at the bottom of the scale. Um, I think his first job, he remember him telling me, was to undo the parcels that came into the office so the string could be used <laughs> subsequently. Um, when he was in Mannheim, he uh, was uh, something of a prodigy, child prodigy as, as a pianist. He played the piano um, there was a lot of music in, in Mannheim uh, in, in those days um, and one of the family myths may possibly be true uh, that Brahms came to visit the, the city and there was a concourse between the little boys as to who would play for the great man and my father came second because he is he must have been eight or nine at the time, he, his feet couldn't reach the pedals. <laughs> and Brahms is said to have taken him on his knee and said, there, there, little man, next time you will play. <laughs> so um, anyway, he, became, he naturalized himself in 1905 and lived for the rest of his life here. Um, what did he do for the rest of his uh, life? He started off uh, in, 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 a, in a firm which was trading in non-ferrous metals and uh, he worked his way up he must have been quite good at it because uh, when the war came he was in a reserved occupation um, uh, because this was key stuff they were importing nickel and lead and, and stuff for making munitions um, when he um, when uh, in 1917 um, this was lifted he joined a, a regiment uh, but which was con uh, which was con uh, which, which uh, was consist consisted of um, anyone with a German name. <laughs> so there were bakers and butchers from Manchester, uh, young men who never didn't speak German and so on. They were put in this, and people like my father, of course. Um, it was the 31st Middlesex Regiment, and it was known as the Kaiser's Own, <laughs> and, and they they were sent to. Um, the North Weald to dig ditches and things like that. And uh, one day he was working fairly near the railway line and all his friends uh, on, from the Stock Exchange were in the carriage looking at him and waving up to him. <laughs> they were going into the city to continue their work. Uh, anyway, he continued with his uh, musical interests. He got the uh, local commandant of the, of the RAF station there to to, to transport his piano out so he could have 
uh, trios and quartets in, in the camp because a lot of people there were like him. They were stockbrokers and, and you know, amateur pianists and so on. And uh, he met my mother, I think, at a concert in London. He was probably a AWOL at the time. Mm. She was the daughter of a civil servant uh, who rose to be chief accountant at the war office. Uh, they didn't mince matters there. They called a war a war. <laughs> it wasn't the Ministry of Defence in those days. And uh, her, her mother came from Ireland, uh, but her father was either a man of Kent or a Kentish man. I mm. forget how the Kent is divided, <laughs> one side of the county or the other. Um, when she was uh, late teens, she more or less ran away from home and became a, a singer. Uh, and she sang for the Carl Rosa Opera Company. Uh, she didn't have a very big voice, but she sang um, sort of second, the second role, the supporting role. Uh, and um, then later on she became a leader singer and sang, sang leader. So we were a musical household mm. and my parents entertained uh, foreign musicians when they came over to London. Um, my father's best friend, I suppose, was Arthur Schnabel, the pianist who mm. used to stay with us. And um, uh, that was the setup for his later development of the children's concerts, mm. which he started in 1923, which uh, became a whole movement. There were concerts for, for children in 23 or 24 mm. uh, centres uh, from uh, uh, Tyneside down to Plymouth, I suppose. This is Schnabel. Before the war. No, no, this was, this was my father. father did this. Oh. Really? They were called Robert Mayer Concerts for Children. Oh. Hmm. Uh, they, he had, they had Malcolm Sargent, who was a very personable hmm. and dynamic person as conductor, who explained the, 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 the pieces to the children before hmm. they were played. But there was no compromise. I mean, they played a, a movement of a, of a Mozart concerto, or they, you know, I mean, it was, hmm. there, was, there was no, they didn't, they didn't pander to hmm. uh, popularize it at all. Hmm. And the children accepted it, of course, hmm. why not? Hmm. Um, what, were they, what was the character of your parents? How would you describe them as people? Um, my father, my father was was an organizer, a networker. Hmm. He liked, uh, uh, with great difficulty, did he get this movement started because hmm. there wasn't much music in the schools in those days. Hmm. So somehow he had to uh, enthusiast the headmasters and the music teachers and then the county councils and the education authorities and finally they to send their school deputations from their schools, group from their schools to these concerts. There were a series of five or six in the season. Um, uh, um, I think he, uh, he was, he, would, he called himself a Tolstoy and I think he, I don't think he ever went to a synagogue. I don't think, I don't think my father, my grandfather did either actually. Um, my mother was, a, was, in a way, I think, more a deeper musician than he was. Um, was she, she Jewish? She couldn't, no, no, she wasn't mm. at all, no. Mm. Um, uh, uh, but she, uh, she couldn't live without music, mm. there's no, no doubt. And she was a much more emotional person mm. than, uh, than my dad. Mm. I think my father left the, left the upbringing of the kids to, to her. You had brothers and sisters, did you? I had a brother and a sister, yes. Mm. Um, so um, my, from, our, from her Irish grandmother, and also from the fact that she uh, became very interested in the whole suffragette movement, she was a suffragette here, mm. and um, with the Irish Renaissance. Mm. I think the opera company went to Dublin in about 1910, so she met J.M. Singh, she met Jack Yates and Willie Yates and mm. Maud Gaughan and all these people. Mm. It must have been a very exciting time to be mm. in Dublin in those days. What, we what is up. your first memory? First memory is, is uh, I think, one, well, the first clear memory is uh, the uh, 1926 general strike. Because living in Regent's Park, um, well, of course, we had no traffic, no buses passed, mm. but they must have had a bus park uh, up near the zoo, 
mm. where there's now a big parking space. Yeah. And they must have put all the buses there ready for these young university volunteers to drive them because mm. uh, that's how the transport was. And I remember looking out of the window and seeing these buses pass us. Um, and buses in those days were private. Mm. Uh, the biggest company was the General Bus Company, which was red. Mm. That's why when it was nationalized, of course, it, 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 they're the red buses. Mm. But Thomas Tilling was, was Mauve, I think, mm. and there were lots of others. And of course, the, the, the tickets were different. So we boys uh, always wanted to travel on the, they were called pirate buses. <laughs> we wanted to travel on anything that wasn't red. So looking out of the window and seeing these buses of different colors going past. <laughs> So you were about four at the time? I suppose I was four then. Yeah. A vague memory of, of, having, a, of having an apple peeled for mm. me. It must have been from my tea. Perhaps I was sitting in a high chair. I don't, I, my memories of the past are not, not very detailed, actually. <laughs> Some people have photographic memories. Mm, they do. Uh, what, um, what was your first school? First school was a Montessori school, of course, mm. a little bit off beach, you see. <laughs> um, and then I went to a, a prep school, which had a, a thing called the Dalton Plan, which you were responsible for planning your own work. Mm. And you had a chart, you had to fill up all the spaces of all the subjects eventually, but you, you could decide how you did it which subjects you, you you did first or the ones you liked or the ones you didn't and so on mm. so it, it was much more flexible than than a, a form system it was a preparatory school that was a prep school and it, and it was um a day, it, a day school no no it was a boarding school, boarding no, school. no 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 I was, she wasn't that <laughs> <laughs> no no she said i was was i was eight or nine where, like where was that it was in surrey where all the prep schools tend to be what was it called it was called Abinger, Abinger Hill, mm. um, uh, and uh, there was some, I haven't kept up with anyone from there. Did, did you basically too, enjoy it or hate it? Or? Ago. Oh yes, no, no I liked it, I had one or two good friends and mm. uh, you know, it worked out well. Mm. Were you any good? I was of course homesick for the few days before I went back, mm. but I think everyone probably was. Mm didn't want to go back. Went, once one was there, mm. it was okay. You weren't bullied? As no, far as no, no. There were one or two, uh, one or two people were, 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 were bullied a bit. Uh, well, heavy teasing, I suppose mm. you would call it. Nothing mm. like the cyber bullying that you uh, read about now, where mm. people's confidence is completely mm. uh, shattered by anonymous t tweets. Mm. Yeah. Were you um, particularly interested in any particular subject at that age or do you No, we, we, I mean, you know, I learnt Latin from the mm. age of eight, I learnt Greek from the age of ten, I suppose. Mm. Uh, I learnt, uh, I learnt, um, we learnt two languages, three languages. Oh, something possibly I should mention too, mm. is that my first language is French. Mm. Um, uh, my my nanny in those days when I had nannies, mm. my nanny was French, mm. and I don't know. I've never. I should have asked my mother more about this, how long she was there, but she must have been there uh, over the time when I learned to speak, mm. because I spoke to her and I spoke in French. Really, and um, that went on. She must have left. And then I suppose there was an English nanny. Mm. So for uh, six months or more, I spoke a language which was half English and half French. No <laughs> one could understand me at all. <laughs> and then later, um, I must have decided, no, I'm an English boy. Mm. And then we used to go to France from uh, over the age of about eight, eight seven, about, I suppose, mm. 1925, 26. Mm. Um, uh, my, I think my parents were exceptional in those days. The, 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 the parents tended to go off on their own mm. and they left the kids to go to Birchington or Littlehampton or somewhere, mm. you see, with the, with the nanny. But they took us down, but I refused to speak any French because <laughs> I was a little English boy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but I've always kept... Uh, uh, there, there are some at atavistic words in mm. French mm. that ring a, a deep bell, I suppose, in my, mm. in my earliest consciousness. 
Mm. And I love speaking it, and uh, mm. uh, I'm very fond of France. Were Were you any good at games? I mean, that sometimes uh, helped. No, you. no, not really. Never, never have been. Um, no, I when I then I uh, when I went to a public school, I went to a place called Bryanston. In, oh yes, very famous. Uh, which again is is offbeat. I think the mm. the system of, of working is the same mm. with these charts. Do you decide when you do it? Uh, um, and there I was, I was uh, an oarsman. I uh, I loved rowing, and uh, uh, they have a river there, and you mm. you they have bumping races and uh, and so on. Mm. Uh, I, I, that, that was my sport. Yeah. And what was uh, how was that school? Did you enjoy that or? Oh, very much so. Yes, mm. yes. I, at first I was a cox, mm. and then when I grew older, then I was a stroke. Mm. But the school. <laughs> but in general, I was never never in the top rank. In general, you liked the school. Yes. Oh, yes. No, no, yeah. Absolutely. Were and we had a remarkable headmaster, mm. Thorold Code, mm. Mr. Code, mm. was a very, very, very exceptional person. I think mm. gave gave people a lot of responsibility mm. for themselves. So you were a prefect. I don't think I was. No, I don't think I was. No, Is that I'm not responsibility? A great, not a great uh, leader in that sort of way. I don't think. No. Mm. But were you in? Engaged in any other particular thing like uh, debating or yes oh yes we had a uh, my parents gave me a I'm one of the first no, so-called noiseless typewriters mm. and uh, uh, myself and uh, Michael Howard the historian mm. he was a co-evil of mine mm. and two or three others we we organised a newspaper. Hmm. So we 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 we're the average newspaper or the average news or something. Hmm. You ask him, he'll be able to <laughs> tell you tell you probably. Um, uh, and we had a debating society. We reported hmm. on the debates hmm. and all this sort of thing in 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 this newspaper. <laughs> Did you have any particular hobbies either at the preparatory or the public school phase? Did you collect things or fish or? Oh, the usual cigarette cards and stamps mm. and, and, and that sort of thing. Mm. But I, I'm not a collector. Um, I, uh, on the whole, um, I, I, I don't, uh, I, I don't, if I, go, if I go to some place, I have to collect, so I have to buy to take home as presents, mm. but I don't collect, collect. for myself. Mm. Which sometimes, of course, is a shame because one has been to places where there were lovely things being, being uh, which one could have bought and mm. beautify. On the other hand, there are, there's always a, a problem. I mean, Rajasthan mm. in the in the early fifties, uh, um, people were cutting out um, manuscripts, uh, miniatures out of books, mm. and selling them. And somehow, I I took a principal stand if I take them. They'll, they'll cut out some more. Mm. Well, of course, actually the result was exactly the same as if I hadn't done it. Mm. But now when I see uh, these, these uh, paintings that I could have had, they would have been rather nice on my walls. Mm. And when I was in Fiji, we were offered a whale's tooth. Mm. Now that uh, has great ritual significance. Mm. And there were various articles that they were being sold for tourism. So we, we were offered this to take mm. home as a curio. We refused it. <laughs> hmm. Did you have any other hobbies? I mean, were you interested in natural history or fishing or um, any no, any kind of anthropological investigations of other cultures or anything else? Well, I Social was, I was exposed or? to other cultures. Hmm. I mean, uh, we were exposed to all the customs. I mean, when we went uh, when we went as a family down driving through France. Uh, in in a in an old Morris Cowley, in what 1927, 26, mm. 27, on roads which were curved, mm. we were always trying to keep on the <laughs> crowd of the road, um, and we were in a small hotels, and uh, when we got to where we were staying, it was a place called Cavalier which is near, quite near St. Tropez, which in those days was just a little fishing village. Mm. And in Cavalier, we made friends with a, a couple of, a, a French family there. And uh, we, if we were swimming, and they came and swam, 
we had to shake hands underwater. <laughs> you, you, you have to shake hands if you meet someone. I don't suppose it happens now. So there's an example of one. Mm, other cultures. <laughs> Something was different. <laughs> mm, mm. Were there any teachers at um, either of your schools who you remember as influencing you much? Inspiring you yes, in any way? Yes, I think, um, I think uh, the first school, uh, I'm trying to, trying to remember the, I remember the headmaster was a very dynamic person. No, the, the, it, at, at Bryanston there was a, um, my, my housemaster I suppose was the person, but basically I think the headmaster, mm. the influence of this man Code uh, was, was, uh, was, was very strong in the school. You, you, you had, you, there were very few rules, it was up to you, and you were responsible for yourself and you were responsible for the community. And if you did something really, really bad, uh, I don't know what, getting drunk on, the, on Dorsetshire cider or something <laughs> like that, um, uh, then you, were, you had, instead of the uniform, which was, which was a pale blue, you had to wear a white shirt. To say you, you, you were, were not you, in were the Were you community. beaten? Hmm? Was there beating? No, no beating, no fagging. Hmm. No, nothing like that. It was a new school. Hmm. I think it started in, 80, in 19... 26, 28, mm. something of this kind. Mm. I think it was Stowe, I think, was another school that was founded in the, in the mm. interwar period. Mm. There were one or two schools like that, mm. which were, which were non-traditional in that sort of way. What, what subjects were you specializing in A-level, presumably? Uh, I liked geography very much. Mm. I think that was, that, was, that was my best subject. I loved mm. geography. Um, uh, languages, I was a bit, bit naughty with my French because uh, since I knew it by ear, mm. I didn't learn all the rules. So when it came to an exam paper, I tended to fly by, mm. by <laughs> whether it sounded all right or not. Um, but I quite liked it, of course. Later I learned German there too. It dropped the, dropped the Greek, mm. kept on with the Latin, of course. You had to mm. take the Latin for mm. little go and all that sort of thing. So. You talk, mentioned Little Go. Did, did you? Where did you go after? No, no. I went. I went. I went to to college in America because uh, I was there with my brother. My brother was American, mm. um, and he was in Harvard. And I went over in the early, the, the beginning of the summer, end of the summer term, to um, have him we, we, on a on a tour to see the country uh, mm. together. So we were both there when war, war was declared what was I, 17 I think at that time, mm. um, and uh, so I stayed on, I went to college in America. Where did you go? A place called St. John's College in mm. Annapolis in Maryland, mm. and there again it was an offbeat um, education, it was a so-called liberal, liberal arts college, mm. so they don't have them here, but that's what mm. they call them there. So we, we, it was based on, on a, a wide variety of books, it was based on texts really. Mm. So uh, you learned some natural science, you started with Lu uh, Euclid and you ended with Lobachevsky. Mm. So from Euclidean uh, to non-Euclidean mm. um, and uh, you had a bit of uh, a different language each year um, uh, and then philosophers and historians and so on. It was a it was a wide, non-specialized mm. education. So you couldn't say this was a degree in X or Y. Not really, no. But in America, you could say it's a it's a degree in liberal studies, mm. the quadrivium and the trivium, mm. and uh, it's a bit of both. <laughs> yeah. Both. Um, then I came back here. My mother, um, she she ran the the religious side of the family, and she went steadily from. Uh, being a nonconformist, a congregationalist, I think steady, steadily downhill, you might say, <laughs> um, until she ended up with the Quakers. Oh. You can't get <laughs> much further than that. Uh, um, uh, she might have tipped over into Unitarianism, or uh, I suppose, but she didn't. Um, so we were brought up 
uh, in my final years as, as a Quaker. And when I came back here, I joined the Friends Ambulance Unit, which was the Quaker uh, Ambulance Unit, which had actually started in the in the First War. And then I was trained this was here. Was about 1942. So that was 43. 43. 43. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so we were given a training. I mean, worked on, on wards, ordinary wards. Then I had three months in an operating theatre, you know, the trays, laying out the trays for the surgeons and all this, counting the, the, the swabs were all out of the body before you sewed it up and all this sort of thing. Um, very interesting. That was extremely interesting because there was a very well-known surgeon. It was in, um, it was Lewis, no, St. James's Hospital, Ballum. And he was doing the first gastrectomies, mm. where you were taking the stomach out or taking bits of it out mm. and so on. And you would be surprised to learn, nowadays, of course, they'd put a camera down your esophagus yes. to see about ulcers. Mm. But in those days, you put, you put the tube down and there was someone who made a little watercolor. There was a light, I'm sure, I can't be imagining this, surely. <laughs> and he made, a, he made, and then the surgeon could see uh, the amount of dead tissue and how, how much he'd had to resect and all the rest mm. of it. Um, anyway, and, and from then, uh, in our hospitals, of course we had to learn to drive a, an HGV. Mm. Then we were attached to uh, uh, an RAMC unit, which itself formed part of the... Uh, uh, the division had a panda. Mm. As, as it sold a flash. I think it was the 4th Armoured Division mm. and it was up in Northumbria. So we were attached there and we learned how to put up dressings, uh, fields, field stations and so mm. on in the middle of the night and all this mm. sort of thing. And um, I was ready in, in, the, in 44, we were all getting ready to, for D-Day mm. and then all of a sudden get a letter saying you're going to India. <laughs> <laughs> This, these things happen constantly in, in big or bureaucratic organizations. So then I went to India and uh, spent two years there. Now the, the, the uh, Friends Ambulance Unit there was, was not doing that sort of medical work. Mm -hmm. It was doing ma uh, relief and rehabilitation, you would say. So first I was in Bengal, the famine had finished, mm -hmm. but there was a, lot, a, a big a program of drug distribution still. Well, um, was the effect of the famine still visible? Oh yeah, well yes, uh, and, and of course a great deal of, um, uh, I mean, the, the, I don't know about Bengal, we didn't d distribute the milk there, it wasn't to the so-called weaker sections of society, mm. uh, but we distributed uh, the first sulfur drugs, mm. which had just come onto the market, and things like uh, hexyl resorcinol, which I think was for, uh, oh, I forget what it was for now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and my, my job, I mean, I was what, 21 something, was to go around the, the, uh, these districts. Were you go, in Calcutta? Or? I was based in Calcutta, but I w spent a lot of time in the, in the districts, mm -hmm. going to hospitals, uh, uh, looking at the books, mm -hmm. and to try to see um, whether the place was ship shape, uh, you couldn't really tell how much was going to the black market, mm. but just someone coming and, and look, asking for the books mm. was a, some sort of a break. Mm. And that was, uh, uh, I did that for several months. Um, very beautiful country, East Bengal, mm. present Bangladesh, mm. and, and there were very few roads in those days. You had river, river boats, mm. which stopped every two or three miles and you mm. people got on and off and, and, mm. and so on and then um, in in South India in Kerala in the in the old Madras presidency mm. uh, not the not the princely state part of mm. Kerala there was a program of that was actually milk distribution for the weaker sections of society so that was ongoing and I took over from someone and we I ran that for Oh, five or six, eight, eight months, eight months, I suppose, I was in Calicut. And then I came back to Bengal, uh, to uh, Calcutta, because we had a, a center there and uh, worked. And then people were very afraid, of course, of famines mm. with the Bengal uh, history. And uh, at the beginning of 1946, there, were, there was, uh, uh, people were very afraid 
in South India of a, of a, food, of a food shortage which could develop into a famine. Um, and uh, they asked the government of India, could, could they send someone to help in this? So the, the unit, uh, with its reputation of, 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 of relief work, was asked, and they, I'd been in South India, mm. so they said, well, let's send Mayor down. So, <laughs> so I went down to Madras, and I helped to set up with the uh, government uh, uh, a, a program which which took in the, the ten deficit districts of the of the presidency, and I think we were giving milk and then some multivitamins to about about a million and a half children. Mm. We were importing it from the states, mm. um, and uh, then of course it had to be uh, uh, landed and it had to be put on trains and taken out, and then it had to be of course distributed. Mm. So. Um, while the, while the, the, the thing was being set up and while the stuff was coming out, um, I, I, I went out, got hold of a jeep, went out to all the, all the sub-districts, the Tessildars, mm. to, to apprise them of the situation. And if you met someone, then he'll remember it. Mm. If it's just a, a, a piece of paper, uh, he, he won't really look at it very much. And collectors were the same. Um, and then once the stuff had ro started rolling out, then we, uh, I had, by then I had two helpers, we, we toured around. So I got to know uh, South India very well. It's mm. very, very, very beautiful. And it was very beautiful in those days. Mm. Um, and I was, I kept a diary and I was reading the diary. And two years ago, one of my Indian uh, um, nieces, who is in Bombay, she said, let's go down to South India. She had a factory down there for handloom. Um, come on, you haven't been down for some time. So we went down and we drove around and into some of the districts which I had been in. I mean, it was different and I wondered why, why? Very obvious. In those days, the road was, was, was gravel. Mm. So it wasn't tar, it was the same color as the, as the fields. Mm. There, was, there were no advertisements, there were almost no houses between villages and between mm. towns, there was nothing. So you looked at nature, and my diaries are full of the changing color of the soil, um, the, 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 the cloud changes, all these natural features that of course nowadays you don't, you don't have. You whiz between one place and another. Petrol stations at every corner and so on. <laughs> no, but uh, I was. Uh, Did no, you start was, learning the language? Any of the language? Um, no, I well, no, I I wasn't there. Somehow, long I didn't work that way really, because everyone was speaking English that I was going, mm. uh, talking to. Um, I learned a little Bengali. Mm -hmm. I learned a little Malayalam. I learned a little Tamil. Now, and I, you know, I had the books and so mm. on, but. Uh, Mm. didn't take off. Mm. No, it wasn't that sort of, uh, it wasn't field work mm. in that mm. sort of way, you see. Then you came back um, in 46? Then, then in, at the end of 46, I got a job as an assistant to the uh, Secretary General of the Institute of Pacific Relations. Mm. In and London? This was an outfit based mm. in New York, mm -hmm. uh, but it was an international. Mm. And the British uh, part of it was the Chatham House, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and they were having a conference in September 47 on the future of the Pacific region. Mm. So the, the, this chap, he was a New Zealander, a very affable person, Bill Holland. Uh, he, he needed an assistant who would do a bit of legwork. Uh, so he, he uh, got to know of me and uh, I forget how, but anyway, um, mm. so he appointed me. To go and he said, "Well, we'll meet in Manila, uh, but you better go to Bangkok and see who see who's there. See if there's anyone who can give a paper." Mm. So I was chucked into. And in those days, when I was told I was going to Siam, it was like I was going to the moon, <laughs> uh, because no one went to places like that. It was really exciting, mm. very exciting indeed. Um, nowadays, you. You're in Bangkok, and you, the terminal is exactly the same as the, mm. the one you've left, and so on. So I went there. I went there 
in a in one of the old flying boats, mm. which was which was uh, uh, linking London and Sydney, mm. and it took seven days, but they had the same crew, only one crew because there was only one a week. Mm. So they flew between eight o'clock in the morning and four o'clock in the afternoon. Then they had tea. Then they had a night's rest. And I went. We started off on the Hooghly, and then we landed on the Irrawaddy and had some lunch, <laughs> and then we. Then we landed on the on the. Uh, it's not the Meenam, is it? No, it's, 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 I forget what it's called in 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 Bangkok, the river. And that was that. Was, then they all went off to to uh, to have have uh, a, a decent evening. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, uh, I went there, and then I went to uh, went to Hong Kong, and uh, and um, uh, looked at the universities in in. Uh, Guangzhou in, in in well in 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 Canton as it was then, mm. staying on the on this Shamin the Shamin the island, mm. which was a foreign uh, a foreign um, concession, mm. um, sturdy houses rather like St John's Wood, with mm. leafy place. Um, Shaman was it? Mm? Yeah. Shaman is it? Sh Sh I think it's called that. Yeah, Shaman is the university with an island beside it. Well, that would be it. Yeah. That would be it. Mm. It, later they built an enormous hotel there. We, I mm. went there in 1885, mm. mm. um, looking down the Pearl River. It was mm. very pretty. Yeah. And then um, I went to Manila and met, met Holland. And then, then we went to um, Shanghai and he had to go home. It was some mm. crisis with the organization. So I carried on to Beijing. Um, this is 1948? This was 47. 47. 47. And the war is still going on in China. Oh yes, yes. I mean, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, we had to fly because the communists were between Shanghai, Nanking, and Beijing. I mean, there wasn't mm. any, any other way; they, were, they weren't connected. I suppose by sea, but uh, nothing else. And it was very Shanghai was a was a disturbed place, and the soldiers uh, were I don't know I don't know how they were paid because. There was rampant inflation. I mean, if one really had to take any kind of sum of money out, you took a suitcase, literally, to the bank. These are the Guamintong, these are the... Yes, it was under Guamintong, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and, the, and the soldiers, they, they'd get on a bus, they just simply push the people out. And we were riding on the bus, we had to, we, we were pushed out too. But the... Uh, I, so was, there, was there great poverty? Yes. Mm. Oh yes, um, but on the other hand, the the smell of the of the people with, sitting on the pavement with the soup, the soup smelled so good. <laughs> and then when I got to to Beijing, of course, we had several feasts, mm. and that was that was you know twenty twenty five courses and so on. Mm. So what uh, what do you have memories of Beijing when you went there? Yes, yes, you, indeed. It hadn't been pulled down by then. No, no, indeed they. The, 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 they closed the gates every evening, mm. so the communists couldn't get in. And the first thing I did, this was in uh, February, March. First thing I did, I went to the, the street of the silk uh, vendors and got myself a long gown. Because mm. everyone was in these long gowns, because it was pretty parky mm. at, that, at that time. And my, my diary, for instance, I. I went from there. I went to Tianjin. I called something else now, yeah. um, and 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 saw the universities there. Mm. And coming back, I said, and, and it's lovely. You come across the flat, and then you see Beijing. You see the Temple of Heaven, mm. and you see the mountain with the with the Tibetan monastery. Mm. That was all there was. There were no high buildings at all, um, and it meant that the. The Forbidden City was part of the, and the, and the Temple of Heaven mm. was part of the city. Did you go now, into the Forbidden City? Oh yes, oh, mm. it was free, and it had all the, all the beautiful works of art, mm. which I then later had to go to Taiwan to see, because <laughs> they, they took they, taken they took them all away with them. Mm. No, no, but they were organic parts of the city, mm. and now I would imagine, they are like in some cities we know, where they just. just Stand up as sort of special places, you know, mm, like uh, the drum tower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, was yeah, the uh, great poverty there as well? 
not not as bad no i don't know i went i can't i i can't remember in in beijing but um uh, when i'd done all the interviewing i had a couple of weeks before i traveled back to san francisco on a, on a on a troop ship um and i had a couple of weeks so i went to one of the because we had a unit in in uh, the friends Embassy unit in china also mm. And during the war, it had been transporting along the Burma Road, it transporting the relief supplies yes. and things. And then they started a rehabilitation center in Honan. Mm. Um, so I thought I'd go up and have a look at the countryside a bit. Mm. Um, it was hair raising because I didn't know a word of Chinese. Mm. And you, from uh, from Nanking, you had to go up a railway. Mm. To a place called Suchow, I think. Yes, Suchow. And and then you joined the the Belgian built Longhai Railway, which went to the west. Mm. And I arrived in in Suchow at about ten o'clock at night. I said, "Well, where to put up? What to do?" Mm. And somehow I managed to make myself understood. I can't remember how. I was put in a hotel, which was an absolute bedlam, <laughs> because it turned out to be a boarding house, <laughs> and the whole night. There were fights between the clients who said they hadn't been uh, served enough, <laughs> and the and the ladies who said well, they'd given them too much. <laughs> but then, uh, about five five or six in the morning, I got away, and and went to this went to the station, and there was a, an old boy who talked some French, but from the time the Belgians built the railway, he must mm. have been the last person. So somehow I managed to get to get you know. But it was um, it was a disturbed, and the, of course the stations were built were little fortresses. Mm. Uh, they were because they you're getting communists. quite close to where the communists. Yeah, well, are. the communists were only only tw- thirty forty miles away mm. to the north. You see, mm. I mean, it was just on the way to Yan'an. In yeah. fact, I suppose. Mm. But but then in the village, well, having seen Indian villages, it wasn't. I mean, they, of course they they looked. They didn't look as poor mm. because if you have someone who's all padded up in clothes and so mm. on, he doesn't look as poor to us at least mm. as someone who's just in a, a dhoti or a lumi mm. or something. Mm. Um, Were they eating? Um, yeah, we reasonably. Yeah, we had uh, we had that manto, that steamed stuff. Yeah, yeah, very simple, of course. Mm. I mean, all these things about Chinese mills with lots of meat and pork and stuff. Mm. Of course, it doesn't work. You were on your own as a, a Westerner in this village. No, no, they had a team there. Oh, oh right. In fact, uh, some oh. of them were, were friends from uh, from from England, mm. and I, I stayed there four or five days, six mm. days, or something like that. So I did see a little bit of China, and then I mm. came, went back to to the States and worked in the in the uh, office there. In New York, and then and then back to England, and worked at Chatham House to organise this conference. This was in '48. Held it held at Stratford. Mm-hmm. Quite difficult because mm-hmm. the, the the transport arrangements were were difficult. This was the end of '47. Mm-hmm. The end of '47, and this is where uh, I, uh, I I met uh, a, a, a fellow anthropologist, or you, you soon to be a fellow, uh, Cyril Belshaw, who was representing mm-hmm. New Zealand. Mm-hmm in this conference who uh, when he heard that I was um, uh, uh, learning Hindi at, at, this, at the sc- School of Oriental S- mm. Studies it was rather uh, rather I felt that uh, this was uh, unsatisfactory I was mm. just learning the language but I wasn't learning anything about the society mm. said well come down to the LSE and you meet my gaffer mm. Raymond Firth and maybe he will um, suggest something to me Mm. So I went down, and Raymond was very affable, and said, "Well, what would you like to go to?" He presented me with a list of seminars. There was a seminar on cultural change. Mm. I think I've told you this story, um, and um, so I said, "Well, this looks interesting. Culture change, my goodness!" So I went to it. It was the famous Malinowski seminar. Wow. <laughs> so after two or three weeks, Raymond asked me, "Well, how, Mr. Mayor, how are you getting on?" I, well, it sounds very interesting, but I can't understand much of it. So he, he laughed. He said, "I think you'd better start at the beginning." <laughs> <laughs> so now I registered for the the diploma. Who I, were the teachers on the diploma? Ah, uh, 
uh, Nadell, mm -hmm. Leach, uh, Audrey Richards. Can um, you give us a mere pen portrait of those three you've mentioned? <laughs> Nadell, Nadell, of course, I worked with him in Canberra afterwards. Um, he was he was uh, 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 quite strict. I mean, I don't know. You mm. must have read the book. The yes, set, I have. Very Davis, severe book. Anthropology. Severe, exactly. He's severe, and he turned out in 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 Canberra also to be to be fairly severe. Mm. And Australians are easy going. He was a bit protocol there. Um, Leach taught me. I think he taught me primitive technology. Mm. <laughs> why, why well, would he, he worked not, on Malay. Why would he do that? He, he, his first work was on Malay canoe construction, canoe. if you remember. Exactly <laughs> right. No, I don't remember that. Um, um, what was your impression so, of him? So, well, well, it wasn't these sort of flights of fancy, because you can't get very far when you're talking about canoe <laughs> building or, or whatever. Mm. Um, and I think he taught me about field work. Um, one thing, I mean, he, one thing he didn't say, don't lose your field notes. <laughs> <laughs> Poor chap had him, lost his, um, uh, no, well, highly uh -huh. approachable, very, very. And uh, Richard, well, it, it was all African, you see, and, and I hadn't been to Africa, and I didn't really... Uh, it was all, it was all different, you know. I just, what was, um, what was Audrey like? Audrey, um, it wasn't inspiring, but then, but then she was talking about age sets and mm. this and that, and things that didn't interest me that mm. much. Not about her nutritional work, not about diet or any of that not stuff. That I, not that I recall, mm. not that I recall. Was there anyone inspiring as a lecturer or teacher? Was Shap there? Raymond. Uh, Shap came a little afterwards. Mm. Shap came a little afterwards. I mean, Raymond, I think, was the mm. was the one. Yes, yes, mm. he, I think so. Yeah, Raymond. Raymond was. Uh, I don't know, it, it, it was. I was interested. Highly, mm. highly interested. And of course, I was very, very motivated mm. to 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 get this thing. Uh, I, I didn't. I didn't think I. would uh, then become an academic at all, mm. uh, but uh, he, he said at the end, he said, "Well, well, I, I'm, I, 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 no, I think, I think Ian Hobin came. Mm. There were a lot of people that came to the seminar when they were in London, and Ian Hobin must have, we must have talked. So Raymond, he must have mentioned me, and Raymond, um, uh, and, and Hobin said, well, if he wants to study Indians, let him go to Fiji." Mm. Uh, I was in for a, a Horniman scholarship, I think mm. it was, um, and I went to see J. H. Hutton, who was really uh, yeah. not a million miles from where we're sitting. Yeah, he's the only person I've I've interviewed or I've met who actually had a nightcap on. He must have had <laughs> flu or something. He was sitting there with a. He had a goatee, I think. In the, in the museum, probably, in our museum. Well, right? it was in his bedroom. Oh. <laughs> and he was at home. He had a... He had a, a, a and he said, oh, well, um, I, I, had a, I had an idea of going back to Kerala, because mm. I knew it a bit, and it was a lovely place. He said, oh, yes, well, you studied the Mukhavans, mm. who were a fisherman down on the beach, you see. I had an idea of going to the Lakadivs. Mm. Um, because my, my one of my friends there was the subdivision officer. He had to go there once a year, and uh, no, no, no. You study the Mukhavans, and the, you know, studying a fish living on a beach with the smell of rotting fish for <laughs> twenty-four hours a day didn't sound me. Luckily, I was proximally accessed. Mm. Harry Powell got the got the got the grant to go mm. to the Trobians. Mm. So then I had to cast around, and then Raymond came up with this idea: "We'll go to Fiji." Mm. Why not? Why mm. not? <laughs> was this to do a, a doctorate, or yes, this was for my doctorate, mm. and I did it there under under Raymond because the ANU w w gave me the grant, the scholarship, mm. but they had no, there weren't any professors in in Canberra at that mm. time. They hadn't. Nadell had not come out. Mm. In fact, uh, by then I was I was married, and we came, we got out to uh, Canberra, and the the ANU was a, just a single wool shed, <laughs> and one end was the 
vice chancellor and the other end was the bursar <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, and um, when I, I, I had a couple of months in the Mitchell Library going through the colonial papers mm. the Fiji papers but the first few days uh, I was, we spent in Canberra and uh, when we were leaving uh, Copeland who was the vice chancellor um, said to Bill Hamilton uh, well how much do you think we ought to Given for living expenses, or, well, I don't know. <laughs> Let, let's. Um, I, I've got. Oh, I've got a friend in Suva. He'll tell us more or less what. So it was done on the back of an envelope. Mm. <laughs> no. Was it enough? It was enough. It was <laughs> enough. Yes. I don't think they realise actually how frugally one does live at the, in the field. <laughs> yes. What was the theme or subject you were going to study? Well, I think it was just how how, how the society worked, mm. because um, uh, these uh, indenture people they came out on a ten-year indenture, mm. five years of which they spent in a barracks working for the sugar mill company, and after that they were given a plot of land if they wanted it, and they were peasant farmers, so to mm. speak, contracted to sell their their their, their cane to the mill to the Australian company, big company called the Colonial Sugar Refining Company, mm. which had the monopoly. So they, they, were, they, were, they were recruited from um, uh, Hindi-speaking areas in eastern UP, which has always been a very poor area, mm. and Bihar, uh, about uh, a third, two-thirds, mm. and one-third from the south. So there were some Tamil speakers, there were not many Malayalam speakers, there was Tamil 25% and the rest were Hindi speaking Bhojpuri or speaking Maithili and um, different castes and some, some, sometimes they were picked up runaway, runaway people, mm. uh, runaway wives, runaway things, uh, picked up on railway stations and bazaars and so on until there's a job uh, in a place called Fiji Oh well, it's, where is it? Oh, it's quite near Calcutta, this sort of thing. Um, and taken down to Calcutta and then, uh, and then taken on ships. And on the ship, of course, you couldn't have caste distinctions. Mm. All this business about eating together and uh, eating from each other's plates and kitchens and all the rest of it simply mm. collapsed. So what happened? When they got Atsu to Fiji, they were put into lines. Again, caste was not a, not a, 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 a criterion. Um, but when they had finished, and most of them stayed on in Fiji, um, what kind of society did they recreate? So that was, that was basically the, uh, hmm. the, 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 the thing which I wanted to hear. What did you find? What was your main finding? Well, I found that they, in fact, they were uh, there was very few, uh, very little institutional organisation. The only, the only hard and fast one, I suppose, was the gang of cane cutters in a in a particular area. The there was no, there were no divisions into villages. There were no centres in villages. Um, well, now I've been in Malabar again, but she has non-nuclear settlement. Uh, but uh, this was really every. Every house was on its little patch of ten acre mm. uh, of cane, uh, and maybe a, maybe a store in the in, in a centre of crossroads or something mm. like that. Um, so there was a tendency for cultural groups to 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 to, uh, to gather in in one particular area, South Indians or Muslims here and uh, Hindi speakers here and so on, but. Um, there was no no formal organisation mm. of that kind, no panchayat or anything mm. like that, at all. Um, uh, the, was only, there the only one marriage? was the, hmm? was there intergroup marriage. No, good lord, no, no, no. There were different linguistic groups, different, mm. different, um, uh, and even even within. I mean, there there were people from lower caste and people from higher caste. And that, that there wasn't any intermarriage, but that was very sub rosa. No one talked about that. Mm. You had to you had to derive that from certain rituals, they might say, or their names, or whatever. Mm. It was all under the earth. So um, the only the only institution was the cane cutting gang. Mm. Now 
that took in, I suppose, 75% of the homesteads, mm. because not all had land. And the, the cane cutting gang had a Sardar who, um, I don't think there was a formal election. I'm not quite sure, I can't remember quite how he was, but he was recognized by the company. Mm. And the company uh, had a, an overseer in each sector uh, who, who ran the thing, and he ran it very well. He, he, he I mean, it was very paternalistic. He told, he told them what, what uh, seed to put in, and he, uh, I think he would, he would have controlled, I would have thought, the number of ratoons, because a ratoon is, after you cut the cane, if you leave it, you'll get another growth. Mm. And that's the first ratoon. Mm. And you can go on and on, but of course it gets weaker and weaker. Mm. So I think they only had one year, one or maximum two. Mm. Some places nowadays in Fiji where it's been completely, well, there's no control, mm. eight or nine times. Mm. So, um, and then the cutting was done with a, with a little portable railway, mm. which was, came into the mill. So the mill organized the cane. So when the cane came from the, from the, uh, from the, um, the actual place, the, the land, he didn't spend any time waiting around and losing sugar content. Mm. He went straight in because they phased it. Uh, so it was a very efficient organization. I don't know how, I think it was about, uh, probably about nine tons of cane to one ton of sugar, something like that. Uh, out there with, with my head full of lineages and clans, the Noor and, mm. and so on, you see, it didn't fit. So uh, the only thing I could do was to uh, to look in the, uh, basically at uh, informal groups, because mm. there weren't any formal groups, and those were factions, of course, mm. who were in interaction about various things, and um, then try and measure, I didn't have do it in numerically, the, the articulation of the settlement, mm. how news went from one place to another, and so on. It, and this is a kind of notional, descriptive thing, mm. but in terms of articulation and then in terms of factions. So I was very much, uh, 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 I was, came, came back and had all these cut and dried books and when it all seemed so cut and dried, it didn't seem to be that way to, for me. Did this lead into your well-known work on quasi-groups? Well, and, yes, I suppose. And could, networks. Yeah. Mm. And, um, and I, and I, uh, I had, I had an idea of pushing this further because after I'd done a village study, which showed the caste was really kinship actually, mm. uh, if you looked at it in terms of the internal uh, organization, not, to, not in terms of the external organization, this is the which Indian. paradoxically was in the village. The Indian work, yeah, yeah. The internal organization was in the region, mm. i.e. the marriage area, mm. and the external was in the village mm. with the smaller group. Mm. which you would think is would be the other way around, wouldn't you? Mm. But uh, then I went to, that was in the 50s, and then in the 60s I went to a, 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 the, the county town, which had been the, the princely capital where Forster's Maharaja lived, um, because uh, I, I reckoned at that time anyway, there were village studies that were just coming out, and there were studies of cities and so on, but there was nothing about a small market town. Mm -hmm. which uh, in that time, uh, the district town was 30,000, 35,000, something like that. Now it's 350. Um, uh, and I saw it as the, as the focus of three interlocking spheres. One was the, the hierarchy of the local government, where uh, under Nehru's government, village councils had been started and then uh, circles of villages made a next tier, and then a district, uh, elected body of villages. So this was a village hierarchy, in which of course some of the villages were, were really good politicians. Um, and then interlocking with that was the, was the political um, party um, organization, which covered of course the town, in which was starting to come into the villages, um, and and covered the whole district, and the third was the municipality, where these uh, political leaders, party leaders, fought it out with elections. 
So the, the three of these spheres interlocked in, the, in this district town. And uh, um, I had the idea of, um, of, of, of writing a book about this and, of, uh, and then of cut, cross-cutting this with the kinds of action sets which were formed drawing from these three, three spheres and the kind of factions which existed and so on. It was a, a nice idea. I never carried it out because when I got back in, at the end of 60 and 61, um, Philip Mason at the Institute of Race Relations asked me to write a book, uh, The History of the Fiji Indians. Mm. And it seemed to me that that was a, a, a very necessary thing to do because they were, they had a, they were discriminated against it and, and no one liked them in Fiji. Mm. And no one even thought they had a history. So I wrote that book and that took me most of the end of 61, 62, because mm. I had to go to the, all the colonial records and so on mm. to really set the record straight. And that was published in 63. And then, and then, then by then the, the this tower the, the district thing had, it was a bit, bit cooler than it had been. And uh, the, the next year, uh, Fuhrer Heimendorf was always uh, avid for, to get people out in the field because he liked going to the field so much himself, I think. Yes. So he said, well, go to Pakistan and see what the uh, possibilities of field work there, um, which sounded very interesting. So I went and had six months in Pakistan, visiting 10 di different districts, and finding the sort of things that could, could be researched. And I think the last week I was there, I got a, a, a letter saying, would you be editor of the new, new man? Hmm. So uh, I got waylaid. Then after that, then the SSRC, then I was six years on that, and that hmm. took a lot of time. So I never got back to this uh, thing, but it's in any archive I have. Hmm. <laughs> it's there for people to rifle around in. I've still got the material, I've got the field notes and the journal and so on. To, to go back to the chronology, you came back from Fiji, then did you get a job? Uh, no, no, the, the Australians then uh, were, were, were kind enough to give me a fellowship mm. on the basis of the Fiji stuff, mm. and that's what I did the Indian uh -huh. village study with. Mm. I, it, it was with Australian money. Oh, I see. And then you wrote that into a book? And then I wrote that into a book, that's right. Mm -hmm. And I was in... What was the theme of that book? And I was in... Um, uh, I was in, in, in Canberra then when Nadell died, mm -hmm. the beginning of 56. Mm -hmm. And uh, Heimendorf uh, was building up the department. He'd already got Colin Rosser mm -hmm. and Freddie Bailey. Mm -hmm. And uh, he asked me if I wanted to come to London. And so I thought, well, it's probably a good idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell me something about uh, Christoph because he was my yes. Well, you PhD know more supervisor. about Christoph than I do. Possibly he was a he was a uh, he was a he was a very engaging person, and he he was uh, as a departmental head. Uh, on the one hand, he was a he was a very good politician. I think an academic politician. People people uh, underestimated him. Mm. I think because he always was rather dégagé and so mm. on. But he, after all, he had been uh, in the Nizam's government mm. as an advisor, so you had to look after your interests uh, there. I should think there were quite a few sharks in that uh, <laughs> outfit, I dare say. So he was really quite good at keeping the department mm. Mm. afloat and expanding the department. Mm. Uh, and on the other hand, I think he was a facilitator. Mm. If you wanted to go to the field, he would do his best to mm. get you there, mm. or whatever it was. He was never didactic about this should mm. be done and that should be done. It was up to you, really, I think. So it was a very loose hand, I would have thought, mm. in that way. What do you, how do you rate him as an anthropologist or ethnographer? Well, the, eth the ethnography in the, in the um, it's, it's, a, it's a little old fashioned, I suppose, but it's very thorough. Mm. The, um, the the Gond stuff. I haven't seen his notebooks, but mm. I would have thought he he was pretty pretty um, pretty thorough. Um, I took a book, book of notes and queries with me the first time, just so I wouldn't miss anything out. Um, Do you was, see any of his films? Feel, feel, the films. Are, well, I'm not very good at 
ass- assessing films. Mm. Um, but he was an explorer. Mm. He was one of the uh, explorer scholars in, uh, in, in that line. Mm. I mean, you, the opening up of Nepal mm. was absolutely what, what uh, suited him fine. Mm. He was the first person up in the Mustang. He was the mm. first person here, first person there. Mm. And of course, he knew how to, I dare say, work the aristocracy in, in mm. Kathmandu and, and so mm. on. So, you, in, a, in, a, in a way, uh, people underrated him, I think. Mm. Were you there when Dor Bahadur Bista came to Suez? As yes. His, as his assistant. And yes. Um, Dor Bah. I don't don't really remember much mm. about what Dor mm. Bahadur did. What, what was he an informant? Yes, there? he was. But he later became professor of anthropology at Tribhuvan. Uh, Tribhuvan, yeah. Yes, and wrote a, several important books about. They were good, Nepal. were they? Very good. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember him giving any papers in in Suez. He'd he'd hoped to stay on at Suez and was rather disappointed. Christoph couldn't get him, ah, get him ah, a job there. I see. But. Um, what about the others? There was John Middleton was there. Yes, John. John was there. Uh, Phil Gully was there. Uh, who else? Abner Cohn. Abner Cohn. Yes. Oh goodness me, where? Because because the, the department. I mean, it 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 it, it got finally to f- cover more, more or less all the fields. Mm. Um, Chinese. Yes. Who was in Chinese? Um, uh, uh, Woody Watson, yes, he mm. went to Harvard, didn't he? I think. Yeah, he did. So, so I think we were covering. By the end, we were covering all the bases, but I, I haven't really kept in touch for thirty years now. Mm. So I really don't know. And the ch- place has changed so much now; mm. it's it's so large. Mm. I mean, there are t- twice as well, maybe even three times as many students as mm. as there were. When I went there, there were hardly any, well, there weren't any undergraduate students at all mm. at, uh, for my first two or three years. Mm. And then they started with uh, Abdullah Bujra and, and David Parkin. Mm. I think they were doing, all the lecturing was done down at, at the LSE. Was it? I have a feeling, yes. Mm. Yeah, the, the examining was done with the examiner's board, with mm. three colleges. So we were fairly late on. Mm. With, with the undergraduate field. Mm. Who would you think um, among, whether it's anthropologists or anyone, most influenced your work? I mean, were you influenced by those Frenchmen, Dumont and co, or...? Um, well, Dumont one could hardly be, <laughs> failed to be. No, no I think, uh, I don't know, at, at one time, because I was interested in, um, well, it, Things like factions and mm. quasi groups and so mm. on and forth, you know, um, not formal uh, groups. I suppose that I gravitated down to action sets, but the, mm. the nature of, you, of action, mm. Parsons mm. Um, coming from Weber mm. and. and uh, John Barnes? John Barnes, no. He, no. he worked on networks. Yeah. yeah. Mm. That was later, I think. Yes, it was. Mm. I think, um, but then I th- then finally, of course, um, you get onto the ra- ra- is it rational or not, and mm. it it can't fully be rational. Well, uh, what goes on in the black box here, you, mm. you can't you can't really tell. Mm. I, well, I don't think you can. Um, so, and then, um, then I of course I got onto uh, to this uh, uh, kingship. Uh, uh, Jag, I went to. I, this is another thing that I suppose diverted me from from trying to write uh, articles and so on. Um, this was through my uh, the 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 forces Maharaja's son, hmm. who, whom I knew for m- many years. And in the in eighty or eighty one, we were talking about. Because I interviewed him several times about what what he thought he was, what kind of a king he was, and how mm. he felt about it, and so on. He said, "Well, you really ought to go around and interview people who still remember those days, mm. and who actually made kings, mm. and so on." And he said, "You, if you don't do it now, mm. they won't be around." So, uh, eighty two, I went. To, I spent several months uh, in Maharashtra and Rajasthan, and then later in South India interviewing all the people 
who had been uh, involved in either the secular or the religious part of of, um, of, of making these rulers uh, uh, kings. And uh, I, I d uh, took them all down with, I interviewed them with tape, and then I transcribed it all. And then I digitized it, so it was about 300, 400 pages of digitized hmm. uh, things. And they, they read quite interesting. Well, there's a lot of duplication, of course, but then you find when you're in one state or another, there are a whole lot of di different idiosyncratic mm. ways of interpreting the, the thing. So it actually is, is more interesting than I thought it might be, <laughs> to me anyway. didn't use a tape recorder? Yes, I did. You did? Yes, but I, didn't, I couldn't keep all the tapes mm. because I was traveling around with the bedding roll, you know. Mm. Mm. So I transcribed every evening. Um, and uh, the English one, of course, I tried absolutely. Mm. From the Hindi, I translated as I went along, mm. which is an approximation, but it, mm. you know, I wasn't doing textual analysis or anything like that. Mm. I mean, there were, of course, uh, uh, in, in some ways, it's, it's, it's not ac academic because well, it's not field work, because field work, you can go back and check. Mm. Whereas these places, I would leave in one place and go to another. Mm. So I learned some more in place B, but I couldn't go back to place A mm. and fight and, and see if that applied there. Mm. So it's uh, you have to oral history better than nothing, better than nothing. Yeah, mm. you've mentioned several times for a Forster's Maharaja. Um, I think you met Forster on yes, well, on one occasion. There again, I think this is quite a short, uh, short to, to talk um, because. Um, this was before I went to the village I'd been interested in, which was in Forces Maharaja's state. Mm. Um, so I went to, he, he didn't really have much to say about it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he'd been to many villages. Um, uh, and uh, as I said to you, I think the only thing I remember is I used the word viable, which he picked up as a neologism that he didn't approve of. <laughs> <laughs> This was but, in uh, Kings. But I took place twice mm. in, the, in the ritual uh, birth of Krishna, mm. uh, which was the uh, climax of the, of the passage to India mm. ritual, and uh, which he must talk about in the Hill of Devi sometime. Mm. Uh, and that was great fun. Mm. Um, you played around uh, as Krishna would have played when he was a baby and so on. You went to the palace for seven years, seven, eight, year, eight days, I think and sang hymns in honor of Krishna. You were there at the birth. Mm. Uh, you took Krishna through the town and put him in the lake, uh, and, uh, you know, as more or less as Foster describes it. Mm. So it was, and in those days, this was in the 50s, um, there were enough of the old uh, Dewas uh, army. Uh, the camel was still there, the elephants were still there to make quite a nice procession as it went mm. through this little town. Mm. So I, I enjoyed that. And then we used to, of course, after, after the procession, uh, His Highness would invite us to have a pig or two <laughs> <laughs> and unwind. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, we're just coming towards the end, but are there any things that you would have liked me to have asked you about? Uh, obviously, huge swathes are missed out, but is there anything particular that I should have uh, mentioned? Your family or um, your wife or...? Um yeah, my wife came, came uh, was in the field with me. Mm. She was a, a, a painter, an artist, mm. and etching and so on. and. Um, she uh, she had a she had a, 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 a good life doing that. Um, she she came on the she came on this uh, you know, tour of, uh, of 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 of, of the, all these princely states, for instance. I think we had a we we enjoyed that. Um, Did you used to, yeah. do, do I remember you used to take Swan Hellenic Well, yes, you tours. see, I'm, 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 a, I'm a believer in the Hindu idea of the four stages of life. And it was quite clear, I had my uh, stage as a, as, a, as a student, 
mm. an ascetic, well, a celibate, a celibate student, mm. until I had finished mm. the, the time with the ambulance unit, mm. because there I was, of course, working in India, so on, but I was celibate and I was a mm. student. Then, then when I, I got back to England, then I started, I got married in 1949, and I started the Grastashram, and I got my daughter, yeah, both married off, yes, mm. absolutely. So I did all my paternal duties, mm. and that ended on September the 30th, 1985, when my time at, in, uh, in, in Saras came to an end. Mm. So after that, of course, you're supposed to go to the forest mm. and start um, thinking deep thoughts. Well, I didn't do that, but I didn't keep on. I had things to finish mm. in the anthropological field, like this Japanese uh, imperial work. Uh, but th then I took on, first I was lecturing with Swan Hellenic, mm. and then I made my own tours. Mm. And my own tours were off piece, you might say, because there are many, many places, there are hundreds of places in India that uh, people who've seen the other places uh, would like to see. I mean, you. You take Benares, now everyone goes to Benares on all the tours, um, but if you go 30 miles, 40 miles northwest, you get to Jaunpur. And Jaunpur had, uh, after Timur sacked Delhi, mm. all the craftsmen left Delhi, they were refugees. And the ruler of Jaunpur all of a sudden found himself without an overlord, got these people in, and he made two um, two mosques or three mosques in a style which is found nowhere else. It has great big mm. slanting pylons in the front. They're very, very magnificent buildings. And there's also a mogul bridge in Jaunpur with the places for the shops on it. You don't see that anywhere else. It's mm. not far. Uh, if you go the other way along the Grand Trunk Road, you only go 50 miles and you get to Sasaram. And Sasaram is where Sher Shah has his mausoleum. His father first, and then him. And his father has the, the, the Sukha Roja, the dry mausoleum, and, the, and Sher Shah, who is the person uh, before the Mughals, mm. um, has the wet moon. And he's, it's in the middle of a lake. And it's a beautiful place. I mean, there are, there are three mausolea in India. The first one is the Taj, and the second, well, it's not in India, it's in pa Pakistan, it's in Bhutan. And this is number three, absolutely. But no one goes there. Mm. Um, so it's these sorts of places uh, which I took people to, and it was the greatest fun. Mm. And uh, I saw hundreds of places which I never would have gone to. Mm. So you have a feeling of, of the country as a whole. Mm. The, the first time I had that feeling, really, I suppose, was in 1940, um, uh, wait a minute, 1940, uh, <laughs> God. 47? Oh God! No, 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 no. When, when, when I was still in the ambulance unit, 40, 46, 45, 46, mm. when I went to Cape Cormoran, mm. Kanyakumari, and it was in Travancore State, it wasn't in mm. British India at the time, mm. and there was simply there a headland, not very high cliffs, and there was a very old Chola temple, and there were a few rocks, kind of shoal, about half a mile off the sea. And then the Antarctic. There were two buildings there. there were the Maharaja had a guest house and there was a traveler's bungalow. That was all there was. It was a magic place. And st standing there, one felt the whole weight of this enormous subcontinent, this enormous uh, sort of bearing down on this tiny point very strange feeling. I've only felt it once before, and that's when I was in uh, Argentina. And you get, uh, I went over to Brazil because there's some famous waterfalls mm. called the Iguazu waterfalls. And you go to the Brazilian side to see an another aspect of them. And that's right at the bottom of southwest east corner of Brazil. Mm. And as I stood there, I felt the whole of Brazil bearing mm -hmm. down on this tiny little spot. Mm. Uh, you know, the Amazon, the, the Bamba and all the rest of it. So it's a strange feat. Now, the, the Cape Cormoran is a, called a Coney Island. It's a Clacton on sea. <laughs> Everyone goes. Uh, well, foreigners don't go very much because mm. it's not, a, not on the route. 
Mm. But the villagers go mm. if they're making a tour of India because it's fairly near a place called Rameshwaram, which is the uh, one of the other major, major temples. So you get people selling seashells and God knows what and what. And I met people there because you all go and see the sun sinking in, in, in the sea, the sunset. And there were people in front of me, some uh, peasants with saffron turbans and the wives had uh, the, the gagra and lugra, the big skirt and so on, mm. and they looked exactly the same as the people in, in central India that I knew. And I went up to them and I said, but brother, where, where, where you come from? And he came from the next district. I said, what community are you? He said, we're Katis. So I said, oh, I know some Katis. Uh, what village are you? Extraordinary. My people had married into his village <laughs> and where we were sitting, 1,500 miles away. So these places where, where uh, it could have been a Benares, of course, it could be Hardwar. Mm. These places you get a, a conflation nowadays because nowadays villagers go and go mm. around India. Mm. They, they hire a bus and off they go. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the four stages that the Hellenic tours were the third. What is the fourth? The fourth one is now I'm downsizing from a house that I've lived in for 60 years. Mm. Um, which is quite a large house and it's full of detritus from that period and I'm going into a three-room three flat and so there will be a lot of detachment uh, from things which I've grown used to living mm. with. Mm. I won't become a, a complete hermit mm. uh, but, it, but I will be detached in many ways in a way that I haven't been up till now. <laughs> well, thank you very yeah. much indeed for yeah. And may I wish you all success in your detachment. Well, yes. Thank you.